Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Photo Justice Photo Moment, the first live daily, as far as I know, photography show on the interwebs. And hey, if you are watching this recorded, rem Ooh, speaking of recording, probably a good idea that I start recording that. Uh, if you're watching this recorded, we do this live, and that's why it's always so insanely crazy, uh, at 9.30 Pacific every weekday. So being here live means that you can participate in the chat. You can ask questions in real time as we go, as you have undoubtedly seen on some of them. And frankly, it just makes the whole thing a lot more fun for all of us, at least for me. So uh, today's topic is, um, it's kind of interesting. I was in, in, the, in the quest to try and find a good topic. I was uh, kind of going to go back to one of my old defaults of, let's just pull an old photo out of the archives and talk about the photo. And I had recently pulled up some pictures that I did for Mercedes a little while ago. Uh, for something else. And I thought, okay, I'll talk about these. And then the more I thought about it, I thought, well, hold on a second. This is a really good story because this is the story of how I switched to Micro Four Thirds for essentially all of my work. Uh, so that's that's the story that I'm going to tell today. So um, this, ooh, actually, what year was this? Let me let me just double check that because I don't remember the year that I did this. 20, uh, 2010, 12, 11, 12, I have no idea. Let's see here. There is a metadata date on this picture somewhere. I am sure that would be under the IPTC data. I have no idea. Oh, 2013. There we go. 2013 is when this story begins. Actually, probably begins a little before that because I have the camera. So my first Micro Four Thirds camera was an Olympus camera. And I might have told this part of the story before, but I'll tell it again. A friend of mine who is a bit of a camera collector had mailed me, shipped me a bunch of cameras to play with. It's good to have friends like this. Uh, there was a Leica S3, the big medium format Leica DSLR shaped camera. That was kind of fun. That's what I did the whole uh, sculpture series with. I think I've talked about that in here before. I know I have, and we'll we'll link to it. Uh, I'm supposed to point this direction. We'll link to a video to that because I know I've talked about that. Um, that was all shot in medium format. So there was that in the bag. There was a Fuji. I have no idea what model number in the bag. Um, and there was an Olympus. OMD 1 or 5 or whatever was the current model at that time uh, in the bag as well. And was there anything else? I think those are the three cameras. So I'm playing with the Leica and the Fuji and, um, and my buddy calls me and says, hey, have you played with the Olympus yet? And I said, no, no, I'm probably not going to. He goes, why not? Well, yeah, I'm a full frame snob. You know, I was shooting Canon full frame. The Fuji APS-C was kind of like, oh, you know, maybe I'll, sh maybe I'll play with that a little bit. Um, obviously, the big sensor on the Leica was kind of awesome. No, you know, I, I like big sensors. He goes, try it. Dude, you got to work with it. Fine. All right, you shipped it to me. I may as well try it out. So I try it out. So I get this camera um, and I start shooting with it, start playing with it. And, you know, just goofing off, playing in the house, maybe go out and shoot some street stuff, whatever. And I really start to enjoy it. And I remember specifically one night at home just shooting. We had some friends over having, I don't know, playing games, playing cards, whatever, and doing some photos really low light. And we're looking at the picture going, well, it actually focused like instantly, which my Canon wouldn't do with that kind of light. And, uh, and the shot was great. Oh, well, this is it's kind of cool. All right, so I'm going to give this a bit more a try. So I played with it more and more and more, and I fell in love with the format. So I started, so I bought my own, uh, bought a body and a couple lenses, and a couple of those lenses, you know, I buy, over time, buying more and more lenses, and um, some of those lenses turned out to be Panasonic lenses, which brought me the path towards the Panasonic from the Olympus, but that's a different story. Um, and hello, Royal. Hello, sir. Thank you for being on. And uh, Travis saying, never caught one of these live before. Well, thanks for being on here. And again, the comments are awesome. Throw out questions as we go, and I will do my best to respond to them. So I've got this Olympus Micro Four Thirds camera, and I'm really enjoying shooting with it. And I know I shot an event, uh, a party. Someone hired me to shoot their you know, anniversary party or something like this. And so I thought, you know, I'm going to shoot with that instead of the big Canon because nice, small, lightweight, unobtrusive. And one of the things I really liked was the articulating LCD. And the OMD had one that flipped out. It didn't do the full on spin out like the GH4 does, but it did a flip up like the GX85 does. I'm just a little flip up like that. And that was really cool. Go waist level, get over your head, that kind of thing. Um, so I shot this party with it and was super pleased with the results. That was, that was one of those, you know, can I do this? Is the client going to be okay with the pictures? Obviously, the client was fine with the pictures. They all look great. They came out great. Um, certainly, the 16 megapixel size was not a problem. You know, they're going to do books out of this and do um, social media stuff. So, you know, the resolution is definitely not a problem. So, I thought, you know, this is an okay one to try it out with. So, I did that. Came out great. Loved, loved the experience shooting with it. Uh, I think I shot a, uh, a band in a bar just kind of that was a favor for a friend so i shot it with that and low light performance worked out great on that so, okay so this is this is getting somewhere and then as a test i did some photos for a local clothing company 
and uh, Claudio, first time here as well. Awesome, man, I love it. Getting some first time viewers in here, this is fantastic. Hey, you guys, let me know how you knew it was live now. Did you get a pop-up notification? I'm trying to figure out how this whole thing is really working, or do you just know to come here now? Let me know in the comments, please. So, um, so I thought, okay, I'm gonna do a commercial shoot. A uh, very low budget local clothing store. Hey, can you do some pictures for us? And you know, whenever it's low budget and you agree to do it, your objective is to get this in and out the door as quickly as possible. So I thought, okay, here's what I'll do. I'm going to shoot the pictures with the Olympus. I will then Wi-Fi those over to my iPhone or iPad. I don't remember at the time what it was. And I'm going to process them in Snapseed or something like that. Give them a vintage look as a vintage clothing store with some vintage photos and deliver them like from the car, right, before I even drive away. And so so I did that. So I'm going to show you those pictures now. And uh, Royal saying, just so that you know, your links in the description are text kind of or should not be. So the links in the description. Yeah, the links. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, because the description that you see right now is a template, is a placeholder. And after the show, we fill in all the data if there was nothing to fill in before. So that's why that's kind of weird. Um, and Claudio is saying by Gmail. So you got a notification from Twitter directly. That's Great. Very cool. Thanks. Okay. So let's pull up these pictures here. So this is a, we'll call this a commercial test. Vintage clothing store, just simple little photos of their clothing and thrown through some ridiculous filter and Snapseed and delivered, like I said, from the car. Shot these, walked out, sat down in my car, imported it, and off I went. So this is very Instagram-y, very... Um, you know, processed kind of look to it. And that's fine. This is what they wanted. And that's great. So that's cool. Okay. So that worked out really well, right? So I did that, did that little test and got the results. I thought, well, this, this can actually work. So then, then came the real test, a proper commercial job for these guys. So Mercedes, I can't say Mercedes called me, a friend of mine who does a lot of work for Mercedes called me and said, hey, we're doing this social media project in the United States. We're going to be shooting in New York and in LA. Got a few photographers together. Um, we need another one. Do you want to be a part of this? And we're going to basically Mercedes is delivering us a bunch of cars in each city. We're going to take these cars, drive them around, take cool pictures of them, post them on the social media account. And you're thinking, I'm going to get paid for this. Cool. Sounds like fun, right? It's the kind of thing you'd do anyway. So I'm thinking this is the perfect first test for, first real commercial test for this camera. I don't remember if I brought my Canons on that shoot or if I really just kind of went all out and just brought the the Micro Four Thirds, the Olympus. I don't remember, but it doesn't matter. I shot only with the Olympus cameras. And so first of all, one of the first things I did was I set the camera to shoot square. Now, when you're, shoot, when you're shooting square on these cameras and I'm I'm always shooting RAW plus JPEG on these because I, I want to get that JPEG that's easy to transfer. And you know now you can transfer the photo, RAW photo, and actually edit the RAW file. But back then, you absolutely couldn't do that on your iOS device. Had to be the JPEG. So shooting RAW plus JPEG, get that JPEG into the camera via Wi-Fi. And I was shooting square so that we knew we were going to Instagram square. This is before Instagram did non-square. So I could see on the LCD preview on the camera the square image. So I knew exactly how it was going to be cropped. So there was no shoot wide and, you know, thinking you're going to crop square and then you go to crop and go, oh, God, I should have, uh, didn't, I can't quite get it. No, I'm just shooting square. So, you yeah, know, that was cool. Um, I could dial in a look in the camera. So I dialed in a little bit of a look, but for the most part, I wanted to be able to do the processing in, you know, God knows what tools at the time, Snapseed and whatever other tools I had to do the processing and then post to the Instagram account. And I think we had, I forget how many a day, a couple a day each that we needed to post. And we had the photographers all we'd group together in the morning and dole out a schedule. Okay, 9 a.m. is Joseph, 10 a.m. is Damo, and 11 a.m. is whatever. And we just kind of spread it out that way. And uh, off we go with our cars to shoot. And what I found was really interesting was everybody else was shooting Nikon, Canon, big DSLRs. When they were posting photos, they were usually posting photos from the day before because of course, they're shooting on their DSLR. Then they got to get out their laptop and import and do the processing on their computer and then transfer it back to their phone and do the do the post. Uh, where and, and some of them were, they would take the time, pull over, go into a cafe or something, edit some photos and get them up that day. So I don't want to say that everybody was posting a day later, but that was definitely something that was happening. Whereas what I was able to do with my little Olympus camera was shoot, transfer to the iPhone, and the next photo that I posted could be one that I just shot 10 minutes ago. And... This was fantastic. Now, 
Obviously, we're posting to Instagram here. It's not like we're doing big, huge billboards. So resolution, clearly not an issue. This became an issue of convenience, being able to transfer the photos and, um, and do that you know, right away in the field to be able to shoot square, get that square aspect ratio while I was shooting. And, um, and just the, the general lightweight ease of use of using the cameras. And then this photo in particular, I'm going to pull this up on the screen in just a moment. But this photo in particular was one that really kind of did it for me. So here, let me go ahead and pull this picture up here. Get that one nice and big on the screen. Oops, wrong button. Come back here. Ugh. Yeah, sorry. I'm opening the one and so that's making it. There we go. Okay, so there's the picture. So this one, this is in Los Angeles. This is this a crazy awesome SLS car. This thing is insane. And um, oops, get this thing out of the way. And I had I knew that there was I guess I can't move that. I knew that uh, I wanted to get a top down shot of this car because it's got these badass ghoul wing doors. And we had a, a local contact in LA and I'm asking and he's you know in the film industry, he shoots all the time in LA. I said, hey, is there a spot where I can shoot this car top down where I can get above it and shoot straight down? And so uh, you know, we're talking about it, he's thinking about it. And he goes, yes, I know the spot. There's a over pat, there's like two roads over one over the other, and there's this hole in one of them, um, air, you know, whatever light hole thing that you can kind of shoot over. So, all right, so we go out there and we're doing this in the middle of the night, so there's no traffic. So, guy pulls in the car underneath for me, and I go up on top. Now, I've got this imagine that my desk is, uh, is a wall, you know, obviously, you get a wall so you don't fall in the hole. And so, I'm thinking, you know, I can just lean over the wall. Well, unfortunately, it wasn't quite that easy because there's the big wall, but then there was a platform beyond that before the hole. So basically, if someone dropped something or stepped over the wall, whatever, they wouldn't just go straight down. There was another gap. So now I got to climb over this wall and stand on this platform <laughs> and uh, to get this shot. But I can't, I can go up to the edge and shoot down, but the thing is really, really thick. So now imagine you're standing on this wall, super thick concrete that you're standing on. So if you put your camera at the edge of that, what's going to be in the shot? You're going to have this huge wall looking down. So I got to get the camera way out. Well, I didn't have a pole or anything to hold it out there. So all I can do is hold the camera out like this. So I remember, flip up that LCD again. Nobody else's camera back then had the flip up LCD. I know this is a lot more common now, but nobody else on the shoot had one of these. Flip up that LCD. I'm holding the camera out as far as I can. I've got a backpack on that's attached, cinched, and I've got guys behind me holding onto my backpack to hold me so I don't fall down the hole. <laughs> Insane. So I'm doing this, I'm holding the camera out and leaning out, leaning in and leaning out, and I'm able to, because I can see the LCD, I can see the picture, I'm able to adjust the angle of the camera and I don't remember on a radio or phone, probably on a phone call to the driver, say, okay, pull the car a little bit forward, backward, turn it, whatever, um, and get the shot set up exactly the way that I want it. And so this is incredible, just hanging out like this and shooting it. Daryl Smith saying, yes, Micro Four Thirds can be awesome for real commercial work. Thank you, brother. That is exactly right. And so, uh, so I got this fat shot. I was stoked about that. So I deliver all my final images. You know, we're, we're, we push them up to Instagram um, as we go, but then we also deliver the high-res images to Mercedes afterwards so they can use them for other stuff if they want to. And no kickback at all, absolute zero kickback of the format that I was using. And so that job, that project is the one that convinced me I can use this for commercial work. So yes, yeah, 16 megapixel is lower than the 21 or 22 or whatever it was that I had on my Canon at the time. It, it's not as much of a difference as it sounds, but it's obviously it's a difference. Today you get Canons that go up to 30 megapixel and you know, whatever. You can get bigger ones. Um, if you go medium format, obviously then you're talking like really big, you know, 50 megapixel kind of images. But the 16 megapixel had, has never been a problem. And now on the uh, GX8, so the the kind of a I, you know, pseudo flagship still photography camera is the 20 megapixel sensor. So I've, I'm back up to that 20 megapixel on here still with a micro four thirds format. Zero kickback ever in all the years now. So since 2013, what is this, 2017, since I've been shooting micro four thirds, have never once had any kickback from any client for shooting this because I'm delivering an image that they need the quality that they need, and that's all that they care about. They shouldn't and don't care about what you're shooting. I actually had a potential client once ask me what kind of gear I was shooting with. And I wrote back and I said, that's like asking a mechanic what kind of wrench he uses. Um, needless to say, I didn't get that job, but I didn't want that. You know, there's, there's times you just, you don't want, there's jobs you don't want. Um, so there you go. So that is the story. Oh, and let me show you the rest of these pictures of how I went to um, Micro Four Thirds. So let me just go through the rest of these. 
let's pull this up and you can see these are all the shots from uh, from that shoot. So this is all this is all New York in the beginning. Um, you know, it just very easy to shoot in the car. This is fun. This one, I mounted the car, uh, the camera onto the front of this Mercedes and drove all over doing, actually, let me go back to that one real quick, and drove all over doing um, slow shutter speed stuff. So come back here. So I am, let's see, got the suction mount. I've shown that, I have no idea. I know I've shown it on videos before, but I don't remember which one, so I can't link to it. But uh, I have this suction mount that I bought specifically for this suction this thing onto the car and then mount my very lightweight micro four thirds camera onto that. You know, you see these suction mounts that have three suctions on them and you can put big old camera rigs. I'm just using a little one. You know, it's well under the weight limit. Uh, the camera's well under the weight limit of this thing. Suction mount this thing onto the hood of the car. And you're driving around a $150,000 brand new Mercedes in the streets of New York with a camera suction cupped onto the hood of the car. You kind of don't want the camera to fall off. That'd be bad. But I had absolute total confidence in this rig. And at the time, that camera didn't allow me to do the Wi-Fi triggering. I don't think. Um, anyway, for whatever, I had it set up on a wired trigger, and I was just driving around and just pushing the button over and over again. Then I stopped, look at the pictures, adjust the shutter speed, trying to get that exact, you know, get the right shutter speed so I could get this shot. And this is exactly what I wanted. Wanted this um, this view where you got the star that's sharp and then the blurry road behind it, uh, and then. You know, the yellow taxis for New York were kind of a requirement, so I managed to get those in there. So, look, so that was that. Uh, let's see what else is in here. So, you know, not all, not every shot is the most exciting shot in the world, but this is, uh, this is what it is. And this is what they wanted, this kind of stuff. And it was a lot of fun to do. A lot of fun to do. All right. A couple more shots in here. There's that one. That's fun. That was in L.A. Now there's that SLS again. There's that one we already talked about. Typical L.A. skyline shot. So, there you go. That's the kind of thing that I did with my first commercial shoot, first real commercial shoot with the Micro Four Thirds, and it has been uphill ever since. It's been great. I've just been doing uh, doing fun work with these cameras. Absolutely love them. Wouldn't give them up. It's, uh, it's a great way to shoot. And of course, now I'm shooting Lumix. I'm now sponsored by Lumix. I'm Lumix Luminary, which is really fun. So um, I get even more excuses to go out and shoot and do all kinds of crazy things with these cameras. And of course, doing stills and video. And you know, we've talked about that stuff before as well. Okay, um, Travis is asking, what Micro Four Thirds camera do you usually use for stills photography? So being a luminary, I, I have the advantage of having several of them. <laughs> If I was going to buy one right now specifically for stills, it would be the GX8, although the GH5 is about to come out and that is going to be even better uh, for stills because of the focus tracking that's in there. It'll have the dual image stabilization, the in-body and in-lens, which you also have in the GX8, but on the GH5, it's the newer upgraded version. GH5 is a more expensive camera. It's twice the price of what the GX8 is. So, you know, that's obviously something to consider. But um, if the uh, if the GX8 is in your price point, that is the one that I would get for still photography straight up. Absolutely 100%. Uh, Claudio is asking, did you... Oh, and, and by the way, and also for smaller, I use the GX85, which is a smaller camera. Um, that one has the original 16 megapixel sensor, but it doesn't have the anti-aliasing filter. So the images are sharper and the... The consensus is that the kind of equivalent resolution, if there's a way to calculate that, between the 20 megapixel sensor with the anti-aliasing filter and the 16 megapixel without the anti-aliasing are essentially the same. The GH5 is the larger sensor without the anti-aliasing, so it's even better up. Um, so the GX85, I love that for a little one. That's mostly what I shot the stills with in Oaxaca. If you saw those photos, if you didn't see those photos, click that link right there. <laughs> You can't if you're watching live, but later, uh, and uh, and you can see those. Um, yeah, so those are the two that I primarily shoot with right now. Claudius, uh, Clouder, sorry, Clouder, Cloud, Clouder TV. I'm kind of trying to see the big text. Uh, is Micro Four Thirds better for video if not doing much photo work? Oh yeah, yeah. There's that's a whole other discussion, but yes, <laughs> video on these cameras is fantastic. Uh, GH4 is my flagship. That's what I shoot all my video on now. GH5 is coming out. That is going to be what I'll be shooting all my video on as soon as that thing comes out. Um, there's, It's interesting because you'll see discussions about people complaining about not being full frame and then they're shooting video. And you look at something like the Canon uh, uh, um, 5D Mark IV, which shoots 4K. It is not using the whole sensor it's not using the full frame and scaling it down to 4K. It is using a 4K crop out of it. So you're not shooting full frame. So people will talk about, oh, the video on these cameras, you're using full frame. No, you're not. So do your research, make sure you understand what it is you're getting. 
people, cinematographers love, love, love these cameras for video. Uh, they line up the size wise, it's equivalent, I believe, I could be getting this wrong, but to Super 35 um, for the film folks. So it's somewhere along, it's, it's all, it's just beautiful. So video, yes, absolutely. We can make that a whole other topic one day if you like. Um, Let's see. Oh, I missed a miss one. It says I believe uh, Royal Grom says I believe my, in my Lumix G6, the best beginner camera for 4K and YouTuber ability. That's awesome. I'm not even familiar with that model. I'll have to look that one up. Uh, and Clutter says also the GH5 has faster autofocus compared to Sony. Okay, so autofocus on the GH5 is supposed to be a game changer. I do not have one in my hands yet, so I cannot personally verify that it is as fast as the claims are. But everything coming out of Panasonic right now says hold on to your hats. This is insanely, incredibly awesome what it's doing. How does it compare to other cameras out there? I have heard, not officially, but I have heard fastest autofocus on the market. Let's just wait until we get our hands on it to really, to really stake that claim. Um, but if it is, let's just say it's going to at least be as good as everything else out there, potentially even better. So GH5, we'll have to see. So here's a video, if you really want to know more about the GH5, here's a video you do have to watch. I did an interview with Sean Robinson from, from Panasonic. It was an hour and a half long, I think, or hour and 15 minute long discussion. And we didn't go into the basics. Oh, what are the bullet points? Because you can see that crap everywhere on the internet. This was a much deeper discussion about specific features, specific things for still, the focus, and really getting into the nitty gritty on it. And the really cool thing about this discussion was that we at the end said, hey, if you, the audience, want to know anything else about it, put it in the comments and we're gonna do a follow-up interview. We're gonna take those questions. Well, that video has been seen well over 10,000 times. It's got, I don't even know how many comments. I have a list of probably 60 or 70 questions now for Sean. He's gonna kill me. Uh, but we are, Sean had to go off on a business trip this week, so I don't think we're gonna get to it this week. But hopefully next week, uh, hopefully soon, we're gonna get the follow-up interview. So I'm gonna have to collate these questions, give them to him in advance to make sure he can get the answers that he may not have for all of them. And then we're gonna do it again. It's gonna be another long video. So link to this video, right there will be is um, grab that watch that video if you have any other questions about the gh5 put them in the comments there and i will add them to the list um and cloud is saying drool if it does drool if it's faster i know man um super fast autofocus focus tracking that's the killer focus tracking on the gh5 is supposed to be out of control good so that's what you really need for both stills and video. And if you're shooting video and you want someone walking across the scene or walking towards you to be able to follow focus on them, that's pretty awesome. To be able to do that on a camera of that size and that price point, pretty phenomenal. Okay, that's it. Uh, any other questions, you know what to do. Drop them in the comments real quick so that I don't forget. I do want to remember to promote some of my own stuff here. If you are enjoying this sort of craziness, um, head over to lynda.com. I have a lot of training up there. This Photography 101 is my newest one. So if you do, uh, if you just go to photojoseph.com slash Linda, that'll get you a 10-day free trial. If you go photojoseph.com slash photo 101, that'll take you right to that uh, photography course and you can check that out. Now, like I said, I have a bunch of other stuff up there as well. So please do, please do check some of that out. Uh, oh, a couple other questions coming in. Uh, so Royal Grom saying, oh, this would be a Lumix G7. Oh, the G7. Yeah, the G7 is fantastic. Love that camera. Uh, have I shot with the EM1 Mark II? I have not because that is a, that's newer since I signed on with Panasonic. So I haven't played with it. I know it's a fantastic camera. It's got some really, really great features in it. People love that camera. So there you go. Um, but no, I haven't personally shot with it. And uh, so there you go. So I don't, don't have an experience for that to relay back to you. Okay, that's it. I'm out of here. Thanks a bunch for your time, guys. And we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.